Yesterday was the 20th anniversary of the terrorist attack that took the lives of 2,977 Americans on September 11, 2001. I was young, I was only 11 at the time, but I remember, I remember some things. I remember my mom canceling our trip to St. Louis to see the arch in the zoo because we didn't know what was safe. I remember that fear. I remember anger. I remember people talking about just launching so many missiles that no one would ever dare attack us again. And I remember sorrow. I remember seeing the press coverage as people wept in the streets for their loved ones. But what I remember most was the question that seemed like everyone was asking, where was God? Was he really in charge? Or had this slipped through his fingers? Was he really all-knowing or was he surprised by this like we were? Was he really just, or would he punish those who did this, or would they get away with it? Today we're going to look at Amos chapters 1 and 2. We'll see a God who is sovereign over all the nations, even those who oppose him. We'll see a God who knows all things, even the sins of faraway people, and most importantly, we'll see a God who is just, and will by no means clear the guilty. So let's pray. Let's ask God to help us worship him for his justice today. Father, we thank you that you are a just God, that those who committed horrible acts 20 years ago, last week, today, those sins will be punished. We thank you for your justice. It is not something we often sing about. It is not something we often meditate on. Our devotions may not be focused on your holy wrath, but God, it is It is such a source of hope and truth when we think about it rightly. So God, we thank you for your justice. We pray that you would help us to worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Go with me in your Bibles to Amos chapter 1. In Amos chapter 1, we're going to see... um, We're going to see God's justice on unbelievers, and we're going to see God's justice on false believers. But to establish the pattern, we'll begin by reading verses 3 through 5. There we read, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Damascus, and for four I will not revoke the punishment, because they have threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of iron. So I will send a fire upon the house of Hazael. And it shall devour the strongholds of Ben-Hadad. I will break the gate bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitants from the valley of Avon and him who holds the scepter from Beth Eden and the people of Syria will go into exile to Ker, says the Lord. In these opening verses, uh, I was reminded of a modern courtroom. As Amos declares God's justice on the unbelievers, we see this pattern of a courtroom established. And the first thing we see is that the court is identified. Before the accused can stand before God, just like in modern courts, the judge must enter. And when the judge enters, what do they say? All stand, right? All rise in honor of the judge. And the court itself is identified with that judge and his authority. That's why the lawyers will say, if it pleases the court. They're not talking about the room. They're talking about the judge. In the same way, before anything else, the judge must be identified. Who then is this judge? Well, Amos tells us, the Lord, Yahweh, God of all. Each prophecy against each nation begins exactly the same way. Thus says the Lord. It's the English way to write God's name, Yahweh. And again, we're reminded of Exodus 34, where God explained who he is and what his name means. He says, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. We learn that Yahweh is a merciful judge, but Yahweh is a just judge. He will by no means clear the guilty. And this is so important for us to understand because as we look through Amos 1 and 2, we're going to see the nations change. We're going to see their crimes change. We're going to see 
the conviction and the condemnation change, but one thing remains the same every single time. Yahweh is the judge. This makes sense naturally to us as monotheistic American Christians, but imagine the audience outside of Israel. Imagine the audience in Edom and Ammon. They believed in many gods. Why did Yahweh's God think he had a right to speak to them? They had the god Milcom, the god of seeing the future. He should be the only one giving prophecies. They had the god Dagon, the god of the sea. Only he should be able to punish Tyre or Gaza, seaside cities. They had the god Chemosh, the god of war. Only he should be able to send armies against anyone. And yet Yahweh claims authority over all realms and all nations and all things. Regardless of who they worshipped, Yahweh would be their judge. Well, what gives him the right to do this? Well, it's because not only is Yahweh God of all, he is also the king God. At the end of verse 8, Amos says, Thus saith the Lord God. The Lord, when you see in the Old Testament the Lord God, that's Adonai, Yahweh together. Adonai means Lord or king. It speaks of absolute unquestioned authority. And though each nation had its own royal palaces and capital cities, ultimately they all had one king, Yahweh. We see a wonderful example of this in verse 3. Look at what God calls their sins. He doesn't call them sins, which is a word that means to miss the mark. He calls them transgressions. A transgression is not an accident, not a you tried your best. A transgression is rebellion. It is active, intentional choice against your appointed authority. So though Damascus had its own king, when they sinned, they were ultimately sinning against the king God, Yahweh Adonai. Well, this is really practical. It means that the people of Damascus would not be judged by Baal's standards. Though he was their God, they would be judged by Yahweh's standards. And today, that means people in Japan will not be judged by Buddha's standards, but will be judged by Yahweh's standards. People in America who, today who do not believe in God will not be judged by the standard of being kind or being good. They will be judged by Yahweh's standard. He is the judge, and he sets the law. He is the God King of all nations. That's the first component, component of this courtroom, but the second is also important. It may seem out of order, but it just further demonstrates the sovereignty of our God. The second thing we see is the conviction pronounced. Just as each prophecy begins with, thus says the Lord, the next statement is always, for three transgressions of this nation and for four, I will not revoke it. What does God mean by this repetition? Well, to, to, to understand it, we have to remember the Israelites and, and how they viewed numbers. Not the book of Numbers, but Numbers themselves. Uh, they viewed the number seven as the number of, of completion. This comes from the creation narrative where God created the world in six days. On the seventh day, he rested. It was done. It was complete. And so in a sense, Amos is saying, look, these nations are really sinful. They've committed three sins. And then they continue to sin. They're really even more sinful. And they've committed four sins. In a sense, they've filled up the cup of sin. It is complete. It is full. God only names one sin for each nation, but that one sin is like the, the final straw, the seventh sin, the completion of rebellion. What then is the result? How will God respond? Well, he says, I will not revoke the punishment. Normally, the one before the judge is only convicted at the end of the case. But this is not a normal case. There will be no defense. There's no evidence or alibis or excuses or plea deals. There will be no appeal process. The sovereign God is the judge, and when he sees the transgressions of these nations, he proclaims his conviction right away. And once he proclaims it, he will not revoke it. He will not turn back his justice. His judgments were sure. That's why when we look at the judgment sections of this narrative, it is never in the possible future tense. It's always in the sure future tense. He doesn't say, I might send fire, or if I feel like it, I'll send fire. No, Yahweh will send fire. The judgment is sure. Once God pronounces conviction, it is set in stone. The gates of Damascus can't stop it. The walls of Gaza can't stop it. The kings of Moab can't stop it. The armies of Ammon can't stop it. No stronghold will withstand his judgment. And friends, if we truly believe this, if we believe that all people will be God, judged by God's standard, if we believe that God's judgment cannot be revoked, it will happen based on who he is, that's going to drastically change how we live. We can't believe the lie that we get to decide what God, what idol, what religious or moral standard we should measure our lives by. And we can't believe the lie that we will escape God's wrath, that maybe he'll change his mind, or maybe we've been good enough. 
So friend, if you're here today, if you're watching online and you believe those things, let me share the gospel with you. God is holy. He's the only one that meets the standard because the standard is absolute perfection. And we all, whether we're from Damascus or Gaza or Jacksonville, have failed that standard. We have all transgressed and rebelled against our King. Our only hope is to put faith in Jesus, who perfectly submitted to His Father on our behalf through the power of the Spirit and took our punishment in our place and rose that we may have life. We can't put our faith in ourselves. We must believe in Christ and His righteousness. And for those of us who are believers, this truth should impact us because we have accepted the gospel, because we do believe this truth. It should motivate us to share the gospel because our family member who maybe they don't think hell is real and they're a pretty good person, well, they will stand before Yahweh. Whether they believe it or not, they will stand and be judged. Our neighbor, perhaps they're a member of a false religion and by their own chosen standards, they're doing great. They will stand before God. Unbelievers in foreign countries who have never heard of Yahweh will stand before him. If we believe this is true, we're going to courageously and passionately share the gospel with those around us. If we believe this is true, we're going to sacrificially give to support the work of missions around the world. So if we are not doing those things, we have to ask, do we really believe what Amos says about Yahweh? Do we really believe He will judge? Do we really believe He is King? We've seen the court and its judge introduced. We've seen the conviction of the guilty, but what are they guilty of? Before we answer that question, we must remember who the intended audience is. Though certainly, I'm sure, nations heard these prophecies, and perhaps some in Moab or some in Edom repented. We hope that that's true. They were not the primary audience of this prophecy. Israel was. Though Amos is talking about other nations, he's speaking to Israel. So rather than go through each prophecy and deal with them and their response and their Thing individually, we're going to examine the sins of these six Gentile nations in a summary fashion. So again, imagining our courtroom, God is judge, he's seated, he's pronounced judgment, and then he brings all six of these Gentile nations to stand before him, and he says, here's your charge, and here's your charge. We see the charges read. And the first we see is the charges against Syria, whose capital was Damascus. We see they sinned against conquered soldiers. Verse 3 says, Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because they have threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of iron. When Amos says they threshed uh, Gilead, this would have brought immediately to the minds of his hearers a specific historical event. Syria had invaded Gilead, an eastern province of Israel, and after they had won the battle, they had threshed Israel's prisoners, of, their prisoners of war. This is what a a threshing sledge would have looked like. It was a very heavy board filled with iron spikes. Its purpose was you would spread out your grain on the ground and you would drag the thresh through it and it would separate the kernels from the chaff and the stalks. Then you could throw those away easily. It was a harvesting tool. But the Syrians took the threshing sledges and dragged them over their prisoners. In modern terms, they committed war crimes. And they stood charged with sin. The second nation, Gaza of the Philistines, is charged in verse 6 against sinning against a conquered people. Verse 6, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four I will not revoke the punishment because they carried into exile a whole people to deliver them up to Edom. The Philistines were a continual enemy of Israel. They'd invaded and they carried off a whole people. In other words, the Philistines invaded Israeli towns captured the entire population and sold the entire population into slavery. Not just the men, but the women and the children and the elderly to make a profit. And just as a side note, because this is really, I think it's really important for us to understand, this kind of slavery is always condemned in Scripture. This is the kind of slavery that was practiced in the Atlantic slave trade in American history. This forced chattel slavery is always condemned. It is abhorrent to God. It is horrific wickedness, and God hates it, and he condemns them. Syria sinned against conquered soldiers. Philistia took it a step further. They sinned against a whole conquered people. And the third nation, Tyre of Sidon, continues the downward trend because they sinned against their allies. Look at verse 9. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyre, and for four I will not revoke the punishment, because they delivered up a whole people to Edom and did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. Just like Philistia, 
Phoenicia, Tyre, had sold people to Edom. They'd captured whole peoples and sold them off. But this was worse because Phoenicia was an ally of Israel. King Solomon, during David's reign, had made a treaty, a covenant brotherhood treaty with the king of Tyre. King Ahab, who was not great, but just a few decades before this, had married Jezebel, a princess of Phoenicia, thus submitting, uh, cementing their covenant. The sin of Phoenicia was worse because not only did they enslave innocent people, they enslaved those who they were supposed to be in alliance with, who they were supposed to protect. But both of these nations sold their slaves to one nation, Edom, and so Edom is the next nation to face its charge. As we continue this downward slope, it just gets worse. In verse 11, we see that God charges Edom with sinning against family. Verse 11 says, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Edom, and for four I will not revoke the punishment, because he pursued his brother with the sword, and cast off all pity, and his anger tore perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. You must remember the nation of Edom descended from Esau, Jacob's brother. They should have been united. But instead, Edom, like their father Esau, hated Isaac and Israel. Their anger tore perpetually like an animal ripping flesh from the bone. They kept their wrath burning forever. They would never let it go out. They fed the fire and they stoked their bitterness. And instead of having any pity that might restrain them, they cast it off, pursuing their brother with a sword, attacking, invading, purchasing slaves. Edom not only sinned against their neighbors or allies, they sinned against family and they did it in bitter wrath. But still it gets worse. For we see God bring charges against the nation of Ammon. And Ammon is charged with sin against women and the unborn. Look at verse 13. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of the Ammonites and for four I will not revoke the punishment. Because they have ripped open pregnant women in Gilead. They might enlarge their border. Ammon had recently invaded Gilead. And they had not only invaded and killed the men... They wanted to make sure that no Israeli men would grow up to challenge them in the area. And so they killed any pregnant women they found who may be carrying male children. They made sure the child died as well. Why would they commit such a horrifying act of genocide? Well, the text tells us to enlarge their border. They cared more for material gain than the life of unborn children and their mothers. To our modern sensibilities, this may certainly seem like the worst sin on the list. But sadly, this act of violence was somewhat common in Israel's day. It was a tactic. You would invade, and then you would rip open the pregnant women. This would scare the population into never revolting or fighting back. So please don't understand me. Morally, murdering women and children is horrifyingly evil, and God hates it and hates it greatly. But we must understand, if we're going to get Amos' point, that he is building here. And so this would probably be at the end of our list. The next sin that we see is actually more shocking, more upsetting. This news would have been upsetting of of their sin, but it would have been common. It's similar to the way we view news of collateral damage from missile strikes. It's just so common now. We're like, man, that's horrible, but we, we don't tend to be that upset about it. I'm not downplaying the evil, but to understand this point, we have to see this progression. So we see the final Gentile nation left, Moab, they sinned against the dead. Verse, or chapter 2, verse 1, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Moab and for four I will not revoke the punishment, because he burned to lime the bones of the king of Edom. Moab had invaded Edom, and during the invasion they'd taken the bones of Edom's king out of its grave, and they had burned it down to powder and possibly used it as paint. They had mixed water and painted things with it. To Israel's ears, this was the most shocking, most unbelievable thing on the list. In Eastern culture, this was unheard of. You respect the dead. In order to even try and imagine the feeling this would have welled up in Israel, we'd have to imagine something like at the height of the Cold War, Russia invading D.C. and taking all of our presidents out of the tomb and burning their bones or destroying the tomb of the unknown soldier. It's shocking. God has charged these nations with their transgressions. It's a disgusting, horrifying list that just gets worse and worse. So how will God respond? We're not going to look at each punishment individually. But throughout these chapters, we see the condemnation promised. And it doesn't just fall on part of the nation. It impacts every part of their life. God condemns the military who committed these sins. The nation's walls and gates and strongholds would be devoured by fire. Their forces would be overwhelmed with shouting and trumpet on the day of battle. 
God condemned their leaders who ordered these sins. Those who held the scepter would be cut off and dethroned. Their dynasties and houses will burn to the ground, never to rise again. And God condemns their people who supported these sins. Some of the nations will be completely wiped out and will cease to exist. Others will go into exile, never to return to their own land. And though all the nations were currently prospering just as Israel was, they would not get away with their sin. God had not missed this evil. He saw the suffering of Gilead's soldiers. He saw the suffering of the whole people enslaved. He saw the suffering of those hated by their family. He saw the suffering of Israel's women and unborn children. God saw all of these things, and he would by no means clear the guilty. These nations stood condemned, and punishment would come upon them sooner than they expected. And this truth should give us hope, especially this weekend. We're reminded of a day America must never forget, a day when wicked men attacked innocent civilians in an attempt to cripple this country with fear. God saw that attack, and those responsible will face his condemnation. But this truth also gives us hope in our daily lives, which are often filled with suffering. God saw the sins of those ancient peoples. God saw the sins of those terrorists 20 years ago, but God also saw the suffering of the employee mocked at work for his faith this last week. And God saw the suffering of the adult child trying to love their sinful parents this week. And God saw the suffering of a million sins against a million innocents that have occurred already today. God saw, and he will not let the condemned escape judgment. So friend, if you have suffered, or if in your past you suffered abuse at the hands of someone you trusted, whether you've suffered recently, please know God knows your suffering. And praise Him, we don't have to fear that those who hurt us will get away with it. For all those charged by God are condemned by God. But you may say, what of the one who accepts Christ? Don't they escape judgment? Don't they escape condemnation? And they do, but Jesus does not. This is one of the most beautiful and horrible things we believe as Christians. That any Syrian who had committed war crimes, or Phoenician that enslaved innocent people, or Amorite who murdered unborn children, anyone today who's committed any sin, all can find hope and salvation in the Messiah. Not because God clears the guilty and ignores sin, but because God poured out his wrath and condemnation on Christ. Jesus suffered on the cross for war criminals. He bled for slavers. He suffocated for abusers. And he died for murderers of children. He took those sins upon himself. And in his suffering, God's condemnation is fully paid. This is why we have hope in Yahweh, the just God, for all the charges against all the nations in all the days of all of history will be condemned and they will be punished, either in the sinner or in the Savior. So friends, let's make this practical. If you have suffered, find comfort in the knowledge that God has seen it and he will not let it go unpunished. Justice will be done. Let me encourage you to meditate and pray through Psalm 22. The psalm tells us of God's all-seeing, all-loving care for those who suffer, even in the midst of our doubt in His goodness. And as you meditate, consider reaching out to someone and sharing the burden you are suffering under. God calls us to carry one another's burdens. Our church would love to do that for you. On the other hand, if you have made someone suffer, be afraid, for God has seen it. Yet if you repent, there is hope, for Jesus has volunteered to take your punishment for you. Spend time this week meditating and praying through Psalm 32. This psalm tells us of the blessing and forgiveness that the most wicked of sinners can find in Jesus. As you meditate, consider reaching out to someone confessing your sin. God calls us to confess our sins to one another, and our church would love to come alongside you and point you to Jesus. God's justice gives us hope and peace and life. He gives it to both the sufferer and the one who makes others suffer, for they meet each other at the foot of the cross. We can have hope in our just God, but this was not the end of Amos' message. You may have noticed I left one nation off the list. We've saved Judah until now because I think Amos is, again, he's building and building an argument. 
He's prophesied against every nation surrounding Israel. He's gone all around in a circle. And the noose is tightening. And the sins are escalating. And so then we see the charge and condemnation of Judah in verses 4 through 5. There we read, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Judah, and for four I will not revoke the punishment, because they have rejected the law of God and have not kept his statutes, But their lies have led them astray, those after which their fathers walked. So I will send a fire upon Judah, and it shall devour the strongholds of Jerusalem. To really grasp Amos' point, to his audience Israel must remember our context. Amos prophesied against six Gentile nations, all of which surround Israel. They probably loved that part. They probably amened but got more and more uncomfortable as the circle closed around them. And now Amos prophesies against Judah, and certainly they viewed themselves as separate nations, but they were still one people. If Judah could be punished and they were the chosen people of God, what about Israel? And look at what Judah was charged with. They're charged with rejecting the law of God, not keeping his statutes, following lying prophets and idols that led them astray. Israel may not have committed the sins of all these Gentile nations, but they knew they had done this. And notice that that charge came last, showing it was the greatest sin. And amazingly, look at that last verse. Judah received the exact same word-for-word condemnation that Gentile nations did. And remember what we said about the numbers. Seven was the number of completion. Amos spoke against six Gentile nations. And then Judah, the seventh one. And I think at that point, Israel was like, oh, good, okay, he's done. There's nothing left to say now, right, Amos? The prophecy is complete. You've gotten to seven. There's, there's nothing left to say, right? But then Amos doesn't close his prophecy in prayer. No music begins to play. And I think at that moment, Israel's stomach dropped because they realized what was about to happen. And Amos capitalizes on the moment. He's shown us clearly and powerfully God's justice on unbelievers. Now Amos will prophesy and show us God's justice against false believers. What had Israel as a nation of false believers done, which demanded God pour out his justice? Well, first we see that they had abused God's grace. Look at verses 6 through 8 of chapter 2. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel, and for four I will not revoke the punishment, because they sell the righteous for silver, and the needy for a pair of sandals, those who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth, and turn uh, turn aside the way of the afflicted. A man and his father go into the same girl, so that my holy name is profaned. They lay themselves down beside every altar, on garments taken in pledge, and in the house of their God they drink the wine of those who have been fined. Just like other nations, Israel is in the court. God has sat down. The conviction is proclaimed. But unlike the other nations, it's not one sin that's named. Amos names a whole list, and we can put them in three categories. First, Israel abused God's grace through injustice. Amos says they sold the righteous for silver and the needy for sandals to get their way. The rich and the powerful bribed the judges of Israel with silver to force the poor who couldn't counter bribe to pay whatever settlement was decided. And these judges were so wicked and had been bribed for so long that now it didn't need to be a bunch of silver, just a pair of sandals will be enough to send someone to prison. It was through these legal means that they trampled the poor into the dust. Those who had nothing already were forced to deeper into affliction and despair because those with wealth turned away and corrupted and perverted the path of the weak and the poor. Doesn't that sound like America today? Though God had been gracious and patient with them, they abused God's grace through increasing injustice in the land. But this was not all. Israel also abused God's justice through immorality. One of the charges that God leads, uh, speaks to them, is that a man and his father would go into the same girl. So this may refer to a man buying a household slave and they sexually abused her as a family, or it may refer to a man and his sons visiting the same cult prostitute, but either way, this was rampant immorality. And it was condemned by many different laws in the covenant, including laws on sexuality and worship and protection of women and incest and a host of others. It was so wicked that God's holy name was being profaned. 
And on top of their sins against the poor and their sins against God's covenant and against women, they also abuse God's grace through idolatry. (coughs) Notice the Israelites are not clinging to the altar that God had built in Jerusalem for their worship. No, the Israelites were laying down beside every altar, any altar they could find. And they worshiped their idols, and as they did, their injustice followed them. They laid down next to their idols on garments taken in pledge. The law specifically forbid this because the poorest of the poor who had no home or money would have a garment that would be both their only clothing and their covering at night. It's what kept them safe. And the rich were taking even that from them. Today, like taking a homeless person's coat and shoes because they owed you money. And as they lay there, they drank wine, which had been purchased through the fines that had been charged through bribing the judges. And not only their injustice, but their immorality also followed them into idol worship. Because the word translated laying down implies they were worshiping by hiring cult prostitutes. And they committed this sin while laying on those garments they had taken from the poor, defiling them. And yet in the midst of all this injustice and morality and idolatry, they still claimed and believed they were going to receive nothing from God but grace. They trusted that no matter what they did, God would only be gracious to them. This is abusing God's grace. But they went further. They abandoned God's grace. We see this in verses 9 through 11. God speaking says, Yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars and who was as strong as the oaks. I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. As also it was I who brought you up out of the land of Egypt and led you 40 years in the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. And I raised up some of your sons for prophets and some of your young men for Nazarites. Is it not indeed so, O people of Israel, declares the Lord? How did God, how did they abandon God's grace? They abandoned God's grace because ultimately he was the source of all they had. He was the one, their grace was what the source of their land. God reminds them that they had not earned this land, they had not conquered it. It was filled with the Amorites, these giants in the land that made them flee back into the desert. God is the one who conquered them. They could not have done it in their own strength, and God defeated them not just partially, but he destroyed the root and the fruit. They would never return. And this was not all. God's grace also gave them their liberty. Israel had not escaped from Egypt by some sneaky ploy. They had not broken out in armed rebellion. They had been redeemed and rescued through the miraculous intervention of Yahweh God through the Exodus. And despite their continued sin and rebellion throughout the desert, God sustained them. Even though they wished the whole time to return to slavery, He was gracious to them. And in His grace, God had also given them prophets and Nazarites to teach His holy word. He, in His grace, gave them their law. He'd given them prophets like Moses to write the law. He'd given them prophets like Amos to remind them of the law. And He had given them Nazarites to live as models of the law. They took oaths that the Nazarite would voluntarily choose to live at a higher standard so that he could devote his whole life to God. Specifically, he promised that he would not drink wine during his oath. They gave their whole lives in devotion. God had given them prophets to to proclaim and Nazarites to model the law. And God cries out, is this not indeed so, Israel? In a sense, giving them an opportunity to defend themselves. Have not, is this, am I wrong? But God's charge goes further. They abandoned all these wonderful gifts of God's grace. They didn't care about them. They weren't remembering who gave them to them. They weren't thankful for them. And we see in verse 12, they actually attacked God's grace. Verse 12, but you made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophets saying, you shall not prophesy. Israel attacked God's grace. Those Nazarites, their faithful examples of holy living were forced by these wicked Israelites to drink wine and break their covenant with God. Billy Smith in his commentary said it this way, worldly-minded people are uncomfortable around those who have a message from God and who model their lives after his character. They have only two options, bring their life into line with God's message and God's model, or Bring the messengers and model into line with their twisted lives. Israel chose the latter option. They hated the faithful model of the Nazarites and they forced them to break 
their vows. And not only that, they commanded the prophets not to prophesy, not to speak the message of God and repentance and life. Friends, this goes far beyond abandoning God's grace and forgetting it. They actively opposed God's grace. And because of this wicked, horrible progression of sin, greater than all the nations, judgment would come upon them, not because God had changed, no, He is faithful, but because Israel had abdicated God's grace. They had given up any claim to it. Look at verses 13 through 16. Behold, I will press you down in your place as a cart full of sheaves presses down. Flight shall perish from the swift, and the strong shall not retain his strength, and the mighty nor the mighty save his life. He who handles the bow will not stand. He who is swift of foot shall not save himself, nor shall he who rides the horse save his life. And he who is stout of heart among the mighty shall flee away naked in that day, declares the Lord. God says, behold, look, listen, pay attention. Because Israel has pressed down God's grace through their abuse and abandonment and attacks, because their sin has pressed down on God's grace like a heavy load of sheaves after harvest, now God will pull the cart across them and press them down. And no natural ability or skill will be able to save them. The swift runners will not be fast enough. The strong and mighty will not be strong enough. The bowmen will not have enough skill. The rider will not even be fast enough. The stoutest and bravest soldiers will cast off all their armor, all their clothing, in desperate need to be faster and still will not escape. The weight of their sin would weigh them down and they would be crushed by the cart of God's wrath. And this warning is not just for Israel. We have seen God's judgment on unbelievers and how great it is. And we have seen that God's judgment on false believers will be even greater, for they claim to follow Him while rejecting His grace. Well, that leaves us with a desperate question. How can we know if we are true or false believers? Well, Amos tells us, true believers do not abuse God's grace. Now, yes, Christians sin. I sin. We're all going to keep sinning. We're not perfect. But there are many false believers today who pray to prayer. They treat Jesus like a get-out-of-hell-free card. Maybe they even come to church every week. But Amos is clear. Those who abuse the grace of God by claiming Christ but living in unrepentant sin are abusing the grace of God. And if nothing else, they're living like unbelievers and most likely are. If we are living in unrepentant injustice, if we are living in unrepentant immorality, if we are living in unrepentant idolatry, we are abusing the grace of God, and most likely, we are not believers. True believers do not abuse God's grace, and true believers do not abandon God's grace. If we are truly in Christ, then we will be thankful for what He has done for us. We, we don't have a land to be thankful for, but has not God given us a whole lot of other things, specifically the church? This is why I talk about all the time, true believers will be in the church, will be members of the church, will be devoted to the church and to one another because they are thankful for the new life and community and not nation, but church that God has given to us. And God has freed us from our sin. He's given us liberty from our sin. True believers are not going to live their lives serving their old masters. If your life is dominated by pornography or sexual addiction or drugs, then you are living and serving a different master than Yahweh, and that is not liberty. Believers will live in liberty, and God has given us the law of Christ and the law of love. True believers do not abandon such a blessed and abundant life. Yes, we may fail and will fall and be tempted, but true believers will never abandon God. And certainly, true believers do not attack God's grace. So let us ask ourselves, how do we respond when we are around someone who is living as a model of righteousness and holiness? Do we rejoice in their example or are we bitter towards them? Are we thankful for their example or do we find it frustrating and annoying? Do we seek to encourage them or do we wish we could tempt them to sin? And what about when we're around those who speak the message of God's word? Do we joyfully listen or are we offended at the truth? Do we seek to learn from them or do we dismiss it as just some other opinion? Do we strive to apply God's word to our heart or do we strive to silence them? Those who abuse, abandon, and attack God's grace show themselves to be false believers. 
And through their lives, they demonstrate that they have abdicated any claim to the grace of God. I'm reminded of the king of England, who certainly by blood could have been king. He was king, but he chose because he loved something else more. He loved a woman more that he abdicated any right to the throne. He could have had it if he had simply valued it more than his idol. The same is true for many people today. Many people could be saved, but they love an idol more, and so they abandon any claim. They don't lose their salvation. I want to be very clear. We cannot lose our salvation. Israel did not lose their salvation. They never had it. They were shown to be false believers the whole time. Many people today claim to be Christians, but they have abdicated any right to do so. And God is clear what will happen to false believers. It will be worse for them than unbelievers because they heard the truth. They knew who Yahweh was. They knew that they would stand before a just God, and they did not care. They will be crushed in His judgment as they deserve. Well, is that the end? Is there then no hope? That's the end of this message in Amos. But I think Amos is always pointing towards his last chapter. Where in Amos 9, 11 and 12, he writes, In that day I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen, and repair its breaches, and raise up its ruins, and rebuild it in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom. And all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord, who does this. Last week, we looked at these verses. We focused on the rebuilding of the tent of David, the house of Messiah, and his forever reign. But look at verse 12. It says, they may possess. Who is the they? It must be Israel. Though the cart of God's wrath would crush them down, they would not be totally destroyed. If any in Israel would confess their sinful abuses of God's grace, if any would return from their abandonment of God's grace, if any would repent of their attacks on God's grace, if anyone in Israel would repent and place their faith in the coming Messiah, they would be saved. And not only saved, that verse is clear, they will never be uprooted again. Those who are planted by God and His grace cannot be uprooted again. We cannot lose our salvation. But if we are false believers, we are in danger. And friends, this promise is not only for the remnant of Israel who had lived as false believers, it's also for the Gentile nations, the unbelievers, who would answer God's call to worship Him in His name. This was not a possibility. It was a promise for the Lord, Yahweh Adonai, the God King, the covenant keeper, is the one who would do this. Amos held out this promise to the unbelieving nations and the false believing Israel. Salvation was still available in the Son of David if they would repent. God graciously sent a prophet to warn them despite their rejection of him. And friends, Jesus holds out the same promise to each one of us today. If you're an unbeliever who has never trusted Christ, if you're a false believer who has never truly trusted Christ, friends, on the authority of the word of God, repent. Place your faith in the son of David in his house that will reign forever and you will be called by his name. You will be saved forevermore. You will never be uprooted for Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God, is the one who does this. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is true. We thank you that it warns us. God, there may be some here, there may be some watching online who are unbelievers, who have never placed their faith in you. There may be some here, there may be some watching online who, God, who are false believers, who are putting on a show outwardly, but are living their lives in injustice and immorality and idolatry. God, I pray for them. I pray you would use the word and your spirit to convict them, to let this warning not simply be words that wash over them, but that sink deeply into their heart like your arrows of truth like the word of God is sword, may it cut deeply into them. Let them not have any peace as they stand before your throne awaiting judgment. God, let them see their need for Christ. 
And God, for the believers who are here, God, my heart is broken as I think about people in my life who I love, who I know will stand before your throne. And though they think they are good enough and they think they are right enough and they're kind enough, God, I know your word is clear that unless they repent, they will be damned. So God, I pray as believers, we would be motivated to share the gospel. We would be passionate to share the gospel. We would be courageous to share the gospel. We would know that there is no point in waiting. There's no need to fear offending them because they will face your judgment. God, make us passionate. And finally, God, I pray for us as believers that we would be thankful. One of Israel's problems is they abandoned your grace. They forgot about it. God, I pray that would never be true of us. We're going to sing a song of praise to you. And God, I pray that it would not simply be a song we sing because we always close our service in song, but that we would truly offer all our praise to you. For apart from your grace, we would perish forever in fire. It would devour us always. God, we deserve nothing less. And yet in the wonderful grace of your son, we find hope in life. We find abundant life. God, give us joy. Give us peace. As COVID continues to challenge us, as wars and rumors of wars are all around us, may we find hope for no matter what happens in this life, we have the promise that your son and his tent will be rebuilt And we will be planted and never uprooted again. Nothing in this life can take us from you. We praise you for that. Let us be thankful and worshipful as we depend on your son. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.